I have developed a really solid relationship with my email list. They are like, they're like my friends. I, I see them when I meet one of them at a conference or something, I'm like, Oh yeah, I know you like you, we've been conversing by email. Like when you develop that, you know, people often say like, I think it's Marie Forleo that teaches in B school. The money is not in the list. The money is in your relationship to the list. Welcome to the Online Genius Podcast, where host and renegade thinking beer brewing lawyer turned online entrepreneur Bobby Klink proves that building and protecting your online genius doesn't have to be rocket science. Bobby and his expert guests break down online marketing and the legal stuff so you can stop sweating the small stuff and get back to building your amazing business. Now, here's your host, Bobby Klink. Hey there, welcome to episode 75 of the Online Genius Podcast. I'm your host, Bobby Klink, and I am truly excited for today's show because we are talking about one of my favorite topics, one of the things that I love the most about online entrepreneurship and online marketing. We're going to be talking about email copywriting. In other words, how to set up the right email sequences, how to write good emails, how to use email to build your business. Now, If you've been following me for a while, and if you're on my email list, you've probably gotten a sense that I really, really love email copywriting, but also email marketing. It's something that I'm passionate about. I enjoy it. I enjoy uh, taking the time to send my weekly emails about this podcast, but also in creating promo sequences and, and emails, inviting people to webinars and all of the other stuff, all the other emails that are part of building an online business. I love it all. I didn't always love it all. I have to admit though, for a long time, it was a struggle for me. I didn't know what to write. I didn't know how to structure an email. I didn't know how to do the basics of email marketing. But then I met someone who really helped me along in my journey. And that's today's guest, Tarzan K. Now, if you've been a follower of the show for a while, this is not the first time Tarzan's been on the show. I had her back way back on episode 32 where she just talked about, you know, conversion copy generally. I had her on to talk about that. And and at the time, I I hadn't really met her before I invited her on the show, but I invited her because, you know, I'd heard her on some other places and I really appreciated what she did. So I had her on there on the show and that came out last June. Well, since that time, we've actually uh, gotten to be friends in the online space. I've met her in real life. We've kind of collaborated on some things and it's been a lot of fun. If you don't know Tarzan, you definitely should. She's a launch strategist and an email copywriter. She teaches digital course creators and also other copywriters how to plan and execute launches and extract the maximum profit from even the smallest of email lists. Now, I also have to say that she is a large part of why I now enjoy writing my emails, but also in how I do it. I went through a program that she offered last fall called Email Stars. It was a group coaching program that really helped me to understand kind of how to create all the different components of a good email marketing system. But also she really helped me with kind of doing the copywriting piece, writing good copy for those emails. And so that's why I wanted to bring her back on the show to talk about it, because I honestly believe that if you can up your email copy game, get to the point that you enjoy writing those emails and that your readers enjoy getting them, you will be leaps and bounds ahead of other entrepreneurs. Literally today is it's a Tuesday as I'm recording this. So my weekly email went out. I've gotten at least five responses already. And that's a typical Tuesday for me when I send these emails out because my list enjoys my emails. I've kind of built this style that people enjoy and the people who don't enjoy it, they leave and that's fine. But you need to try to accomplish the same thing. I'll tell you that will be a huge indicator of your success, a huge driver of your success as an entrepreneur. If you get to the point that your email list consistently enjoys getting your emails, and I'm talking about just enjoys reading them, forget whether they're going to click or not. If they get to that point, then you're golden. Because then when you come to time to promote something, guess what? 
they're going to want to open your emails. And if they want to open your emails, they're going to react. And so you'll be able to actually get the most out of it. I'm a big proponent of list building, but then engaging with your email list through good email copy, because I know that's part of the reason why I'm able to, you know, have the revenue I have today without a huge list. I mean, I have a list that's under 5,000 people still, but I'm doing launches and non-launch launches like I talked about in last week's episode that really surpass what a lot of people with much bigger lists are able to do. And the reason why is because I have taken the time to work on my email marketing game. So I encourage you to do the same. So this episode is full of great advice. So, you know, I hope you'll stick or stick around and listen to it. But before we get to that, this show, as always, this episode is brought to you by the Online Genius Academy. It's the free academy, or not the academy, sorry, the community. It's the free online community, the free Facebook group, where you can join me for kind of a back and forth direct engagement. It's a place where, you know, it's not just about me talking to you or talking at you. It's about us having a conversation and us going back and forth and sharing ideas about marketing, about legal stuff, and about anything else that that kind of fits, you know, really within that broad rubric. So I'd love for you to join me. You can do so by going to youronlinegenius.com forward slash community. Again, youronlinegenius.com forward slash community, and you can join absolutely free. So without further ado, here's my interview with Tarzan K about email and email copyright. Hey, Tarzan, welcome back to the show. Bobby, I am so excited to hang out with you. I've been looking forward to it all day. Yeah, really, you're just jealous, Tarzan, because you're no longer, you know, number one among you know guests. So we, we gotta we gotta get you up there. I know. I gotta think about all my best jokes so that I get number one. I want to be your number one guest. So listeners, if you haven't checked it out before, I talked to Tarzan back on episode 32. And we talked about, you know, concepts about, you know, conversion copywriting generally. And that's great. But today we're actually going to do something more specific. We're going to talk about email. And Tarzan, why are you so passionate about email? Let me just start there because I know you are and I want to hear why you are. Okay. I'm so obsessed with email. For one thing, I just love it. Like email is something that I'm really good at. It's my superpower. I'm not like, I'm not great on social media. My Instagram account is like just pictures of my kids. And on Facebook, I'm like, so, so I sometimes remember to post if I have like something for sale. Like I'm not, I'm not great on those channels, but I've chosen to really focus on email and I just love it so much. Like I just, I get so much great feedback it's how I get to know my subscribers and my customers. And, you know, it's, it's, I feel like it belongs to me. I have those names. It's my list is there for me. Like if I need to get some private clients books, like I can just email my list when I'm doing a promotion. Like I just, I love my email. I love having an email list. I love the people on my, I love everything about email, Bobby. I could talk about it all day. Well, well, you know, I love email. I know. <laughs> And, and, you know, listeners, if you don't know this, if you don't like my emails, blame, blame Tarzan. She doesn't write them for me, but she taught me what I know about email. So if you don't like my style, it's all her fault. Bobby, you are such a great example of how to do email well. And I think me and like lots of people in your audience, like we felt the shift when you just like it clicked in for you and you were like, okay, this is what I'm doing now. And you started showing up in email very differently. And you're like, so real. I love reading your emails. They're really good. (laughs) Well, I appreciate that. And, and yes, there, there was a shift at two times. Number one, I I shifted and, and started putting myself more into my emails and being more authentically me. And that happened to coincide with the time that I went through a, a, an email training program with you. And and Mm -hmm. so I refined it even more, but one of the things that you're, you know, big about talking about is that you don't have to have a huge email list to have a big impact and tell people why, you know, how is it that you can succeed without having a huge list? Mm, I love this. And in fact, I was just reading an email from Laura Belgray this morning. She was talking about the same thing. Like she and me as well, like we're able to get the same results as someone with an email list that's like 10 or 20 times bigger And the reason is that like, I have developed a really solid relationship with my email list. They are like, 
they're like my friends. I, I see them when I meet one of them at a conference or something, I'm like, Oh yeah, I know you like you, we've been conversing by email. Like when you develop that, you know, people often say like, I think it's Marie Forleo that teaches in B school. The money is not in the list. The money is in your relationship to the list. And when I heard that, I was like, okay, yeah, that, yeah, I guess that makes sense. But now that I'm really in it, I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. Like these relationships, like it's not my relationship to the list. It's like my relationship to all of these individuals on the list is that I feel like it's a really strong bond. Like even people that just email me once in a while, when I'm emailing my list, like I trust them and I'm really open with them. Like I reveal like a lot of stuff, like just just uh, today, for example, I sent out an email about a promo that I had just done that was not very good. And I was like, it was like really hard to be in this promo that didn't give back to me what I gave to it. Someone emailed me back right away and was like, Tarzan, I can't wait to see this presentation you're doing. And I just appreciate you being so real. Like I get those emails all the time. Thanks for being so real. Yeah. And and I love those emails. And, and I think Marie does say something like that, but I also love you know, our friend, Amy Porterfield, she says, you know, a lot of people say that the strength of your business is uh, related to the size of your list. And she says it differently. She says that, you know, the size of your engaged audience Mm, is a good measure of the health of your business. And I think that's the big difference. You're saying you'd rather have a smaller engaged list rather than worry about vanity metrics. Is that basically? Totally. Yes, totally. So people ask all the time, like they'll say, what is a small list? And, or like how many people on your list? And like, actually those answers aren't really that helpful because engage, like it doesn't matter if you have 10,000 people on your list and they're not very engaged, like you may as well not even have that list. Like sometimes whenever I have a new client that will come to me and they'll be like, okay, like I'm excited to do this launch. And like, I have 15,000 people on my email list. I'll be like, okay, so when was the last time you emailed them? Like, do they reply to your emails when you send out an offer? Like, do they buy it? Do they, when you're launching something, like, do they reply to your emails and ask you questions? Like, is there a back and forth? And it, like a lot of people, it, they will like have a big list, but I'm like, I will tell them. And this is why in the program that you did with me on the very second week, I was like, let's scrub the list. Everyone has to scrub your list. So that's when clients come to me and they're like, I have this big list. I'm like, okay, well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to scrub that list and figure out how many people you actually have on your list. Yeah. And I just actually went through a scrub recently and I talked about it in a podcast episode, you know, and I, I openly share my numbers. I'm at, I literally have my, my email service provider open right now. My general newsletter segment has just over 4,300 people in it, but I've, sh- I've personally deleted more than that from my list in the last mm-hmm. year. That's I think I've scrubbed cool. my list three different times and each time, oh, wow. you know, I just, okay, whatever. Goodbye. Yeah. Goodbye. Like you could be just keeping, you could have 12,000 and you would be feeling so good about it, but you would be paying an extra like several hundred per year. Yep. to like float those people that aren't doing anything and they drag down your open rates. Like it's just such a great idea to keep your list scrubbed because then you actually, you can actually tell like, are, are people receiving my emails? Are they clicking on them? You remember in like early on in the program that you did with me, someone, one of my students was like, Tarzan, I, I used to get like great open rates and now like it used to be like 30, 40%. And now I'm down to like eight, what's going on? I was like, <laughs> don't have a problem. It's like your list. It hasn't been scrubbed ever. Yeah. And so many people are reluctant because we had, there was someone else in that group I know who talked about having like eight or 9,000 people yeah. on her list, but I think had literally never emailed them. And she'd collected this list over like years. I said, okay, <laughs> yes. you don't actually have eight or 9,000 people on your list. <laughs> yeah. You said that. I think you were so loving <laughs> as you always are. You were like, you probably have 300. It'd be <laughs> nice if you have 300. Yeah, Maybe. And, I, and, and I know she resisted. I don't know if she ever did scrub her list, but you know, yeah. I, you know, I love that. So why don't you talk about Let's talk about this quickly. How do you scrub or suggest people scrub their list? What's the metrics? When do they do it? How often? And then we're going to talk about actually how to, you know, get engagement from the people who are there. Sure. Yeah. So I think in terms of how often it depends, I would do it more often if you're running ads. 
because I find like the, when you're running at like organic subscribers are way stronger than subscribers that you paid for. Yep. So if you're growing your list really organically, I think once or twice a year is fine. If you're doing Facebook ads, definitely twice a year, maybe even more at any time, basically anytime you feel like your open rates are starting to plummet. So what I do is I create a segment. And to be honest, we have a process that I've handed off to my assistant, Sandra. And when I, so I created the process. And then when I went to teach it to my group, I was like, oh man, I have to like go and look at what we actually do. But this is what we basically do. So we create a segment of people that look like they're probably cold. So they're like people that haven't opened anything or haven't clicked on anything in like the last three months. And if you're doing this quarterly, you could just use three months as your like, you know, standard. And then I send them a re-engagement sequence and it's only three emails. They're like really sweet. They're really cute. They're very easy to read. Like they are not lengthy at all. They're like, Hey, like, and I will give it like a really, really like prominent subject line. Like, you know, some people like to use the, do you hate me subject line after a launch? I love to use that on a re-engagement campaign. So that might be the first email. And it's like, Hey, you haven't been opening my emails or clicking anything. Like, do you hate me? Or maybe you like, I'm going to, and then it will say like in soft language, like, do you want to stay or do you want to go click this link to stay, click this link to go. You definitely want them to unsubscribe if at all possible, because then you keep their data And this is like different with different email service providers. But in many cases, if you have to delete someone, like you're deleting them and their data is gone. So you want them to actively unsubscribe so you can sort of track what they've been doing. Because some of these people may have purchased something from you. Yep. So I got off on a tangent there. That would be the first email. And the third email, I will say like, I am deleting you. And that might even be the subject line. I'm deleting you. And then at the end of those three emails, everyone who hasn't opened or clicked anything, they just get deleted. Yeah. Bye-bye, which is hard. Yeah. And so so I use something very similar. What I did because, and, and we'll probably talk about this in a little bit. I have a welcome sequence, which takes people almost a month to get through. So what I did is I said, okay, anybody who's been on my newsletter segment for at least 60 days and hasn't opened anything in 90 days, I put on my cold list. And then I sent these three emails. And my my first subject line is, do we need to go on a break? And the <laughs> on a break was a quote, you know, for those of us who grew up in the 90s, we we know, we know the yeah. friends reference. But Ross. Yeah, Ross. exactly. <laughs> but so I did that. And like I said, I don't remember. It was really strange. I, I I did not get a lot of a lot of action until the last email, quite honestly. And, you know, and what happened on the last email? Uh, I'm pulling up my stats now. I, I you know, I, I don't I didn't even keep 10%, I'm pretty sure, of the people who yeah. were tagged as cold, but let me see. Well, I can pull this up. Yeah, quickly. I mean, you're doing a great job of like actually figuring out who's cold. And if they've been through your nurture sequence, you move them to your newsletter sequence. And then they haven't opened anything in 60 or 90 days. They're like, that is very cold. It's like bringing people back from the dead. Right. Well, and especially because I I tend to use some racy subject lines from time to time. (laughs) So, you know, I mean, if people aren't opening my email with, you know, Russian stripper in the subject line, they're probably not going to actually open my emails. Yeah, Uh, that's a very good point. But yeah, I mean, that's the thing. A lot of my, you know, I found like a lot of like when I send these re-engagement campaigns, like the first one, I got 30 people opened it out of 1,300 people mm. it was sent to. So, I mean, you know, just, mm. I, I was annoyed. Somebody marked it as spam. I was like, wait, I gave you a link to just unsubscribe. Why didn't you just do that? Mm, yeah, but, people get mad about email sometime. And that's actually important. Like we talked about that. That's another thing we talked about in the group. When people had like some sort of hater, they would come and celebrate and be like, yep. oh, look, like someone doesn't like my email. And we would all have a good laugh about it, but it does hurt. Like, it, and I always want to acknowledge people when they are like, someone sent me a mean email. I'm like, yeah, that happens. And don't take it too seriously, but I know it still hurts. Yeah. So I think that's a perfect way to pivot into how to build an engaged audience because Honestly, Tarzan, I don't think I told you this. I was joking with some friends. There was a period recently where I went three weeks without a spam complaint. And, and I was like, okay, what's, what's going wrong? 
Am I not? <laughs> am I not being engaging enough? Because I honestly believe that if I go three weeks, and again, I'm sending emails to 4,300 people. If I send emails to 4,300 people three weeks in a row, and I didn't piss somebody off, mm. I'm probably not doing enough. And yeah. so, <laughs> that's my approach now that I learned, I guess, kind of by you know being willing to open up. But how do you go about building an engaged audience? So a couple of different ways. The main thing, and I recommend people who have a manageable size list to do this, like my emails are sent from my email address. Like if you hit reply, it comes to my inbox. And I don't know how long I'm going to be able to maintain that, but I'm going to keep going for as long as possible because that's my primary way of building relationships. So in, I I don't do this anymore because it got a bit overwhelming, but I used to have in my welcome sequence, I asked them a question. And so I would get all these fun replies. Like some, it was something really basic, like where are you at in your business right now? Or it helped me get to know my subscribers. And also like, they're so delighted when they get a reply from me. And I was like, Oh, okay, well, this is really great. So then now if someone often, if someone replies to an email, if they have a question, like I will sometimes make them a a video reply. And I just added video to my email strategy this year. And I am so excited about it because it's a such an awesome relationship builder. It's great for answering questions quickly. People are like so delighted to see me with email. So that's been a really big one. And we can continue that conversation in a second. Other ways, honestly, the main thing is like I show up regularly And that's the biggest, like we've gone into some like pretty deep stuff. Like, you know, that whole list scrubbing thing that we just talked about. Like, I mean, a lot of your listeners are going to be like, oh, this is overwhelming because actually where a lot of people I find are stuck at is just like showing up each week or every other week or whatever, like just being consistent. Like that is the primary way to build a relationship with your audience. Yeah. And I think that's absolutely right. And it's showing up. And what I'll, what I'll tell you listeners is if you're not doing it, if you're not sending a weekly email, it's going to be hard at first. Mm, and yeah. you're going to feel it's going to be really hard to write something that is authentically you. Mm. But guess what? It gets easier. And, you know, I've shared this with you, like Tarzan, I think you responded to one of my emails saying it was a great email. And I said, <laughs> I wrote it in 15 minutes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Get there. Totally. You yeah. get there with practice, yeah. but yeah, so showing up is important and I love the video option, but I think also a big thing that's important. And you, you talked about this and both of you and I have kind of talked about our welcome sequence or nurture sequence. Talk about what that is kind of in broad strokes and why it's important. A welcome sequence and why it's important. Okay. I, I always recommend that people have a welcome sequence, but before I even go there, I want to say like, If you don't have a welcome sequence, that's okay. Lots of big superstars that you know. Like, actually, I think even Marie Forleo, until she just did her big rebrand, which was probably about 18 months ago, did not have a welcome sequence, which not saying it's not a huge missed opportunity, but I do like the main thing. I'm just going to say this one more time. The main thing is just like start emailing your list and doing it regularly. A welcome sequence is great. Like, that's the next thing to add. So basically like this is where you are developing no like and trust in your welcome sequence. So a welcome sequence is a great place for people to get to know you. So introduce them to like some really important things about you. Like, you know, I like the sorts of references you drop all the time. Like I love Hamilton. So like I talk about Hamilton, the musical, that might be like something good to talk about in my welcome sequence, your welcome sequence. And here's a really, okay, maybe this is the most important thing. Your welcome sequence doesn't just have to welcome people. You can totally sell them something. And in fact, I would love to see like every welcome sequence end in some sort of offer. That's like, it it can be a low price thing, but um, why not? Because you will find just by making an offer, people will buy it. Even if it's a small percentage, those people that do buy like a low price thing from you, if they like it, they're going to be predisposed to buy more things from you. It's just a missed opportunity. If you put something on autopilot, like why not have a little sale at the end of it? So you don't have to think about it as like, this is only nurture. I'm not allowed to sell anything. In my 
So currently I have at the top of my funnel, a quiz. So you get the, you take the quiz and then you get like an email about your quiz results. And then you get invited to a webinar and there's like this whole funnel attached to it. So a welcome sequence can be like any type of sequence. Literally, it can be a a series of webinar invites. It can be a series of promotional emails. Like think about your welcome sequence as like, this is just like, it can be any sort of sequence, whatever you want it to be. Yeah. and, And mine was more complicated because I have a short nurture sequence where I try to sell people related to what they download. Mm-hmm. And then I have a, a welcome sequence where I just introduce myself and the various aspects of, of my brand, you know, the, the podcast, the, the, the online community, and then all of these other things. And I do something a, di- a bit different. And I don't know if you've tried this. If you are someone who has a second freebie that most people would appreciate, Include it in your welcome sequence, give it to them for free, kind of, you know, establish that you're someone who's going to just give them a ton of value. And I think that's part of why people love me is they're like, uh, you just keep giving me more stuff (laughs) and you know, it's good. So, I mean, you can't, you don't want to give them too much, but I think it can be a useful strategy. Yeah, I agree. Especially if it, especially if it's like the logical next step, that would be great. It's like, you got this free thing. I maybe showed you how to use it a little bit in the welcome sequence. And then, Hey, here, this would be the next step is like this other free thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that can work. Another thing that, that I, I do want to dive a little bit deeper in when we come to welcome sequences, because I think I'm pretty sure you know who told me this, you basically pointed out that the problem is your welcome sequence is the time that your readers are going to have the least patience with you mm. because they don't know you yet. And mm-hmm. so d- does that factor into how you write emails in your welcome sequence? Hmm. I haven't thought about that. I love that you brought that up. I haven't thought about that, but I do subconsciously, I suppose I have, because in one of my sequences, uh, again, this is my quiz funnel. I think it's based on what, what results. So not everyone would get this just for your listeners who are like, I want to see this picture. So this is like the first or second email that you get. And it's a gif of me swimming in my pool. And I'm like, all like starfish, like swimming. And <laughs> like, I definitely did that intentionally. A picture of myself in a bikini and a funny story. Uh, because yeah, I, I agree. Like they have the least patience. They really, they actually often are only opening the email to get the free thing. So it is so important to get their attention there. I think it's cool when people use GIFs. I would make one though that's like your own thing. I wouldn't like grab one on jiffy.com. Yeah. So picture, like a picture is great. Just make sure it doesn't, uh, I think the limit, I forget what the limit is. My friend Val Geisler, who teaches about email, she taught me that images should be no more than 20%, I think. It might have been 40% of your over or your whole email. And also you never want the image to be right at the top because that's something that you'll get penalized for. It will affect your deliverability. So you want at least a little bit of text at the top before you have the photo. Okay. And so actually I, I'm going to take that thing you said right there and make a point for listeners mm-hmm. who are listening. And I don't know if my listeners are going to fall in this camp, but it's not even related to this this image generally. But a lot of people want to do these stylized emails where they put their logo at t- on the top or something like that. I know your opinion on that. So what, why don't you tell me your opinion about putting things like that at the top of your email? Uh, I think there was like, there was a, a, a period of time. I feel like it was maybe early 2010s or something where everyone had to have this banner. And I feel like maybe it was a, it was a MailChimp template or something that we all just had to use to have that banner. You do not need it. If you really want to have it, just put some text on the top of it. You know, I write plain text emails. I love, I'm a writer. I want the words to stand out. I, I, and don't get me wrong. Like I love branding. I like right in front of me, I have like a branded mug, like a branded pop socket on my phone. I have a big sign behind me. Like I love branding, but with my emails, like I really just want the text to get the attention. So that's what I do. And I also think like those graphics, especially when they're the same in every email, like they just like, to me, it feels way out of style. There's this one email list I've been on for like years and years. And thank God her emails are so good because every single email at the top of it, there's like this massive graphic 
that takes forever to load. It's not like responsive. So it doesn't load the right size. Like it drives me absolutely insane. And if those emails weren't ridiculously good, I would have unsubscribed so long ago. Like just like drop the fancy branding and just like tell me what I need to know. Yeah. And I think it also goes back to um, your, 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 what you said earlier that people on your email list, they feel like they're your friend. Yeah. And that's because the emails look like an email that you would, I mean, other than the nasty, ugly footer we've got to have in for can spam and all those other things. It, it looks like an email that you just get from your friend, plain text, et cetera. And so I love that. But now I do want to talk about how do you write a good email? And I don't mean you, but I mean, how do my listeners, I mean, what are the keys to writing a good email? So I would say the most important thing is a story. And you're like, I would start with the story. Think about like, okay, what am, what am I this week? Like I am inviting people to come and listen to this, like a debrief of my last launch. So the story there is like, oh my God, that was the hardest launch I ever did. And I wanted to hide in the closet and pretend it wasn't happening the whole time. So that's my story. And I'm going to start with the story. You can't, if you start with story, you cannot fail and you'll get better at telling stories. Like that's, that's important to know if you feel like you're not that great, not that natural a storyteller. One copywriting technique that is known among copywriters. Hold on. Let me think of the name for it. It's called in media res. And I think that's actually a movie term. Some people call it the battlefield principle. And basically it means that you drop the, you drop your reader in the middle of the action. So if you think about the battlefield, like when you're telling a story of an epic battle, you don't start with like, well, first the prince from another country went to see the king and then they wanted to do this business deal and the deal went wrong. And then this guy got mad and like, no, like you start and it's like, two kings in the middle of the field, bodies all around them, sword to sword, who's going to win, right? Like that's where you start the story. So, and especially if there's like an unusual detail, like I just said, this wasn't what my email said, but you know, I just told you like, I wanted to hide in the closet and pretend my launch wasn't happening. Like that would be a great way to open the email. I wouldn't even start with like, so I sent out some promo emails and I noticed my open rates were lower than usual. Then I tried this and also, hmm, that didn't seem to work either. Like that would be a so-so story email. Much stronger if I'm if I start you off by telling you like I wanted to hide in the closet. Cause then you're I mean, it's like, well, why did Tarzan want to hide in the closet? I must know more. Yeah. So and I and I mean I think that's a good example. And let me give listeners another example. I've used one of the the core stories that I tell in my brand journey is how I started my own law firm because I made one of the mistakes that I now help other entrepreneurs stop making. But the funny thing is that that happened when my daughter was three months old. So I, at one point had an email where I started and I, I, you know, I basically started the email about, you know, so there I was holding my three month old, looking at my Harvard degree with no job and no idea what to do. And then you kind of flash back to the beginning of the story because people want to know how in the world did you get there? Yeah. And you're doing that with your subject lines too. Like you have a funny subject line about Amy Porterfield. Like it's something <laughs> like my wife wondered why I was taking <laughs> pictures with other women. I think there's yeah. something in the subject line about that. Like that's brilliant. So yeah. if you can put the hook in the subject line, even better. Yeah. And so listeners, I think the important thing to get is, and and, and Tarzan used the, the word hook there. The way I like to think of and try to write my emails is hook, story, and then whatever the call to action is. And the hook is that hopefully it's that in medias res or whatever, however you yeah. pronounce that Latin phrase, something from the middle climactic point of the story mm -hmm. that you can use short and sweet. But I've got to ask you this because I see people asking this question all the time. Literally last week in one of these groups that I'm in, people mm -hmm. were asking about how long emails should be. A lot of people think that you've got to go short or you've got to go really long. And I know there's not actually a right answer here, but mm -hmm. what, what do you tell people when they ask you that question? So it depends on the action you need to get them to take. So you will okay. see that sales emails are often a lot longer. So there's this one email that I always include in a promo sequence. And I learned this from my friend, Rye Schwartz, who's written for many, many blockbuster launches 
he teaches this upgraded FAQ email. And I use this all the time. So basically it's like in the mid, like in the middle sort of end period of the cart close phase. And in that email, I will answer like six or seven even frequently asked questions. And they're important questions like how much time will it take? Uh, is it for me? Um, like what I think I'm a special case, like, you know, the basics, but um, right. that's always a long email because the people who are still engaged at that point and who are reading those emails, like they really want all those details. So that has to be long. There's some things that can be a lot shorter, like a show up sequence, for example. I think a show up sequence is strongest when there are short emails that are fun and engaging. Really, like all you need the show up sequence to do is remind people why they signed up and why they should show up. So that doesn't really take as long. And then when it comes to your newsletter emails, like as long as they need to be, like sometimes if I'm sharing a, like a longer story or that, then it might be a little bit longer. In some cases, it's like, hey, oh, so I did this email one time. This was one of my most successful emails. And I think the subject line, this is a story that I tell all the time and I won't tell it today, but it's like that when I first, when Amy Porterfield first approached me about working with her, I said, no. So, but then of, of course I said, yes, like shortly after. So I wrote a blog post about it. And prior to like, so let's say the blog post came out on Tuesday, on Monday, I sent out an email that was like three sentences or something. It was like the first time Amy Porterfield asked about working with her, I said, no. Want to know why? Like tune in tomorrow to find out. And of course, like everyone loved that. I got so many replies, like, I'm so curious. I can't wait to hear. So that was a really short email. Another, there's a famous email that is talked about lots in the marketing world, the nine word email. And I think this actually came from the real estate world. And the nine word email is like, are you still looking to buy a house? That's probably not even nine words, but you know, you can use that. Like, let's say, I'm looking, I want to book some new clients. The, my nine word email would be like, are you still planning on launching in 2019? Like that yeah. email, that's really powerful. And there's lots of different versions of it. So it means, I know that's like, this is where actually swipes and templates can be handy because it's always different. Yeah. Well, and again, I had, it wasn't about email specifically, but last week when I was in social media marketing world, I went to Ray Edwards presentation and he had a great line. There's no such thing as copy that's too long, just copy that's too boring. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you have yeah. good copy, you're telling good stories, people aren't going to complain about it. Agreed. But, but also, quite honestly, you and I both know this, they may not read it, but that doesn't mean they don't want to get it. It may be mm -hmm. like, I'm not going to read this one, but, you know, I'll come back to it. So, yeah. So there's also just to further complicate things, something that I learned from my friend, Sarah Greer is like these, and lots of, there's lots of different systems for like categorizing based on people's personalities. But I like the way she explained this because it was really simple. There are four colors. The red is like the action takers. And if we're thinking in terms of an email, it could be like, I don't even care. Like, just give me the link, right? Yep. Like I've already made my decision before I even opened your email, right? That's me. I'm a red. Then there's the green and the green is like, they're the people that like read the whole thing, like every single word from the beginning to the end. And they will cite you like three weeks later, like, but Tarzan, you said this in the email that you sent on March 23rd. So there's the greens. And then there's the yellows that are, the yellows are often like motivated by fun. So like, I will make it like really engaging. And like, that's where like, they like fun pictures and funny jokes and then there's the blues and the blues are like emotionally motivated. So if it's like a story with a lot of heart, that's like some like bleeding heart confession, like they will really like that. So I always like sort of try and put a little bit of, of like a little something for all of those types, but inevitably like I'm, I'm going to send an email that's like more emotional and I'll get like more of the blues and that they're going to like be liking it and replying to it. And then I'll send something that's like really funny. And I get the yellows that are like, Hey, Tarzan, I love you so much. Anyway, there's one interesting framework. I think that's good for deciding what you need, how you need to write your email. Yeah. And I think something to point out from that though, is, and, and I don't remember if it's red or whoever it is, who's just give me the link already. They're not going to be mad about a long email. because They're just going to scroll, no. find the link, yeah. click the link and go. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. It's funny. Like I, I, writes like I write these long ass sales pages, but I don't read them. Like yeah, me either. I I just buy them. 
Yeah. So I, I was thinking about that today. Literally today, I, I, you know, I bought something and it was the same thing. I was like, okay, you know, I had to go through this long series. Like, just give me the link already. Oh my gosh, Bobby, before, right before I got on this call, I was on a webinar and I was like, <laughs> come on. Like, I just like, give me the buy button. Like I'm sold. Like this is like going on and on. I just like, I got to buy the thing. Yeah. Yeah. You, you and I are, you and I are those kind of people who are like, we know what we want. We're like, okay, just give it to me already. Yeah. Um, yeah. And in fact, interestingly, like, I think when you joined my group, my group program, you were like, I, we didn't do a call or anything. You were just like, okay, yeah. Like I'll take this package, like sign me up. No, no, we did do a call, but oh, we did. Okay. We, we did, but you the <laughs> webinar, right? No, because we, we had, we had talked in advance at, at Amy's right. event and, and, but again, this was, you know, your call there was not exactly the, the a, a hard sell. It was like, well, here's what I got. I was like, yeah, yeah, just send me the info. And then- Yeah, exactly. Because I, no. well, I knew I didn't need to hard close you. Yeah, yeah. So so I do want to talk about that now because listeners, I think I've talked about this before, but I took a, it was a group, she calls it a mastermind. I call it a group coaching program from Tarzan. We can have the that you know debate <laughs> uh, called Email Stars. And- Tell me a little bit about how you came up with the idea to do it and and what was the promise you were offering people? Mm, Thank you for asking. So this is my second run, my second go around the block, creating an email program. And initially my email program was like, it was more basic. It's for beginners. And, but people came back to me again and again, and they were like, is is there, do you teach about launching in that program? I was like, "Uh, no, I don't. So, and in the meantime, like between these two programs, I became known for someone who's really good at email. So really what the group, it's a group, you're right. It's group coaching more than a mastermind. I agree. I've come around to admit it, even though I still call it a mastermind. Win. Um, I, I, I call that a win. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, you win, Bobby. You win that round for sure. Dinner's on me next time. The program really like it takes people through the entire customer journey. As I said before, like we start with scrubbing because most people need to scrub their list and copywriters, there's a lot of copywriters in this program. They need to know how to do that with their clients. So we start with scrubbing, but then we take them through the entire customer journey from like the moment they come to your email list to the last email they see in your like online program launch. And we also cover things like, um, you know, how to actually like do a launch without doing a promo sequence and just like skip it and get people on a call. Like we look at lots of different ways to do launches that are not necessarily like the standard sort of webinar to promo sequence. And the, what I really, what I hope and what I see for people at the end of the program is like, they're much more confident with email. They know exactly what they're doing and they're not just throwing stuff at the wall to see what sticks. And what I really love about the people that I've been fortunate to attract, like they really have long game because I am not making a promise that's like, take my program and you'll make six figures next year. Like that's not it at all because email, what I have seen, like I've been consistently emailing my list for, I'm going to say two and a half years now. And it took about, like, I had a really, like, a list of several hundred people for the first year, but it took, you know, it took consistently nurturing them before I felt like now I have a this amazing engaged list that I can rely on anytime I put an offer out there to actually, like, respond and buy it from me and, like, share it with their friends. So that's what I would hope for the students in my program to have, like, the tools to be able to build that type of relationship, but also like they are turning around and doing really fun things. Like you had a great launch right immediately after another one of my students, like she actually, this is so rare. She did her first launch and she did this like book a call series instead of doing the whole promo thing. Like we made it really simple. She did this book a call thing and made like 25,000 on her first ever launch, which is amazing. Like that almost never happens. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I want to echo that about it being for the long game because I definitely agree with that. I mean, I had been emailing my list regularly last year, but it was until about August, it was kind of boring. Mm. And I really started adding and people started coming around. And now, you know, I'm I'm starting to get to the point that I feel like people are like, okay, when can I just buy your stuff? Mm. Tell me, I, I want to buy your stuff already. Mm. And so it takes a while. Yeah. And 
it is one of those things. I see all these other people in the space who basically just do launches, say two or three times a year. They focus all their effort there. They don't email their list between, they Mm -hmm. don't nurture them. And so they have these big, huge cold lists and they're not having a lot of success. And so I think, you know, and I think my listeners understand this because I've talked about the power of email. I believe it is the most powerful thing you could be doing in your business. So definitely need to do it. But also, Tarzan, you undersell what we went through <laughs> in that. Oh, program. please. I'm so enlighten me in how I'm underselling it. I can't wait to hear. Uh, I mean, you, because basically what you did, and, and I mean, you just glossed over it quickly. Uh, you gave us an overview of all of the different sequences that you're going to need in addition to your weekly email, which we talked about, but the different sequences like a nurture sequence, a welcome sequence, the the confirmation email and how to write a good confirmation email instead of here's your free thing. And then the promo sequences and the <laughs> book a call right. sequences. Book a call, can, show up sequences. Yeah. Show up sequences, webinar invite sequences. We just went through all of it. And as I recall, you gave a swipe for all of it. Every single one. Oh yeah. <laughs> hundreds, hundreds of emails. Yeah. And so by the end, if, you know, you know, you, everybody in the group had all of the stuff they needed to essentially have, you know, a full set of sequences. And to me, that's the hard part, right? The, yeah. the weekly yeah. emails you get good at, but getting all the sequences right is the hardest mm-hmm. thing. And so you really yeah. walked us through that, which was fantastic. And, and, you know, now I have all of my sequences just running in the background. Plus I've got stuff that I set out while I was in it that now I can use and repurpose for later. So I love it so much, Bobby. If you're looking for a second job, you can do sales calls for me. (laughs) Depends on what percentage you're going to give me there. (laughs) Okay. Well, let's think about that. (laughs) But so if my, cause this is going to be coming out, you know, uh, I think you're running this again this year, right? You're going to run the, yeah. So Yeah, it's going to open on May the 14th. Okay, so listeners, if you're listening to this live or some semblance of, you know, soon, you know, before live, you might, and you're interested in this, you should definitely reach out to Tarzan. And Tarzan, how should they get in touch with you, get on your list? Uh, Where should they find you for this or just more generally? Yeah, so if you go to, hold on, I'm just going to make up this link and I will create it after I get off. If you go to tarzank.com slash Bobby, I am going to have a special freebie there, which will be a promo sequence swipe. And honestly, this promo sequence swipe, it's one of my best. It's something that has consistently performed for me year over year. As Bobby said, like, when you have a swipe, like something to start from, and you're not looking at a blank screen, oh my God, does it save you so much time. So if you go to tarzank.com slash Bobby, you will find a promo sequence. It's a 10 email swipe. It's ready for you to download and make your own and go sell some stuff. Yeah. And I'm going to assume that's the swipe she gave me in the group and it was fantastic. Mm -hmm. I used it. She mentioned it. I used that to create an email only launch that I did in the middle of the program that made some money. And then it was the basis of my promo sequence for my 53K launch in January. So it's a good. Ah, I love that. I love that so much. So it's definitely a good one. Tarzan, this has been great. Thank you. Anything I should have asked you about email that I didn't though, before we get off? Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, what do I wish you would have asked me? Oh yeah. Okay. Last thing. And I'll make this really quick. I wish you would have asked me about my number one favorite thing that I'm doing with email right now. Okay. And I just discovered this tool called bomb bomb, yep. like, you know, like bombs. And with bomb bomb, it has this amazing, like it, like it, I don't know, like it's a Gmail extension, I guess. So I can open up Gmail and send video emails like directly from my browser, which is so fun during the launch. Like when you're launching and people are asking you questions, like, boom, you just like make a quick video. I wrote a blog post about this and I checked my stats. I have made 130 videos this year, like personalized videos. And I would estimate that those 130 videos probably took me a total of three or four hours. It's just so fast. And these video replies are like, ah, they're the best. BombBomb makes this little GIF, which I really love. And it's like, I, I challenge you not to click on it. You will click on it. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And you told me about that in the middle of my last launch. And and I, I 
started using it. Unfortunately, my problem is I use, I was not using Gmail. I used mm. Time Outlook for Mac, which they oh, did yeah. not. If I was on a PC, I could have used it, but I couldn't use it on my Mac. So yeah. So, but is your email on G Suite? Yeah, now it is. It wasn't before. Oh, now- it wasn't before. Okay, yeah. Because I actually don't usually check my email in a browser. Like I use a program for Mac called Postbox. Yep. But during a launch, like I just log in in the browser because I can send videos really fast. Yeah, and what I, what I was going to do with it, quite honestly, was I was going to basically create a list of the people who had clicked through to my mm-hmm. sales page, but hadn't mm-hmm. bought mm-hmm. rank them. And then basically just send personalized emails to or personalized yeah. videos to each one of those people. Again, think about it, listeners. If you do a 30 second uh, or a minute yes. long video that is actually personalized, you say their name, yeah. it's going to connect you with them and yeah. they're going to be much more likely to buy. Yeah. And you know what else you can do? Because BombBomb creates this GIF that's like, it's like the first three seconds of your video And what, like when I first signed up, I did a call with one of their reps and he had a whiteboard and he wrote my name on it. So in the video, like I could see that it was personalized because it said like Tarzan on it. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And the right. So do something like that. And people will know that this literally is for them. It's not a mass mailing. So that's definitely something to do. So bomb bomb yeah, is, is a great resource. And I know a lot of people who are doing similar or a few people who are doing similar things that have gotten great results. So I'm definitely going to look into it again. And listeners, you should think about it too. Thank you for that last tip, which is very actionable, Tarzan. Well, Bobby, I got to say thank you because, you know, you know that in a program, like when people buy your programs, like it's a small percentage of people that really show up and do it. And you like, you show up like 200% and it's so awesome to watch like, wow, like you're doing it and look how fast your business is growing. It's amazing. Well, I appreciate that. That's, that's one of the things I do is, you know, when I, when I do something, I go all in. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sometimes it works. Sometimes I make mistakes. (laughs) That's part of it. Yeah, That's part of it though. But thank you for coming on. It has been a blast and we're going to have to have you come on again at some point else. We're going to have to figure something else to talk about. Oh, I'm sure I'll think of something. As soon as I start slipping in the ranks, you know, (laughs) I'll have to be back to get that number one spot. Yeah. Well, thanks again. And listeners, that's it for this week's episode of the Online Genius Podcast. I'll be back here again next week with another episode for you, and I'll see you then. Thanks for listening to the Online Genius Podcast. Make sure to tune in next week for more great tips, tricks, and strategies to help you build and protect your online genius.